of inflation. How behavioral economics unveil the human dimension of markets. Ulrike Malmendia, University of California, Berkeley. On November the 9th, 1989, I was home with my parents and we tried to understand what Gunter Schabowski had just announced when we heard it in the evening news one hour later. If you grow up in Germany, you learn about the concept of inflation and what it can do to human lives pretty early in your life. Textbooks of 20th century history are full of pictures like this of the Weimar hyperinflation with bundles and bundles of Reichsmarks worthless other than for children to play with. You also learn what happened afterwards, how the economic turmoil gave rise to political turmoil and ultimately the Nazis. Everybody who lived through those times reports that they've been scarred by this experience. They continue to worry about inflation, what inflation can do to lives and to their country. Modern economics, however, turns out to have no room for such long-lasting effects. In economics, inflation is just the increase in prices, for example, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, and if that rises too fast, as it did recently, Central bankers like Madame Malagarde come in, they raise interest rates, they work through the money supply, maybe dampen a little bit consumer optimism and purchasing, and back we go, hopefully, to 2% target inflation. And we should be back to where we were before. We should all be acting and looking at the world as we did before. The problem is, it doesn't work. For starters, Germans are still obsessed about inflation. We have somewhat of a reputation among our European neighbors, worrying every time the ECB does something, the European Central Bank might not be combating inflation enough. But we are certainly not alone. In any circumstances, any country where people have lived through constantly raising prices in the supermarket, at the gas pump, they experience the prices creep going up, that experience tends to leave a scar. It tends to change us, and that's a global phenomenon. One central banker who had to deal with high inflation, double-digit inflation himself, former Fed chairman Paul Volcker, acknowledged that when saying that an entire generation in the 70s, when he was trying to get inflation down, an entire generation he was facing had seen throughout their lives Nothing but inflation. In fact, inflation that seems to keep increasing. And he remarked that under these circumstances, it's hardly surprising that many of those people begin to wonder whether it's realistic to anticipate a return to price stability. What he's saying is, these announcements I'm trying to make about credible policies, which everybody should understand, and maybe even does understand, will combat inflation they won't have an effect until the people see it for themselves in their supermarket at their gas pump. And that is exactly the failure traditional economics has had. In traditional economics, there's no room for such long-lasting effects. If I personally live through a crisis, that may, of course, economically affect me. It may lower my income, my wealth. It may affect other outcomes, health, family choices, fertility choices, Sure, it may also affect my beliefs. I might be updating my beliefs about future realizations differently, but that's it. Above and beyond that, there shouldn't be any effect. There shouldn't be any scar from living through high or hyperinflation. There shouldn't be any effect being a depression baby, having lived through the great depression that has on me, exper experiencing unemployment in my life, living through a pandemic. And this is where a new generation of economic models comes in. Economic models that try to acknowledge the overwhelming evidence from neuroscience, psychiatry, medicine, biology, that as we walk through life, we see things, things happen to us, we are scarred, this leaves a lasting effect on us. Our brain gets rewired, that's neuroplasticity, and concepts like synaptic tagging help us to predict much better our behavior in the future. 
So let me draw a parallel to neuroscience that helps to illustrate, and that's the concept of synaptic tagging. We know from neuroscience that every time we have a new experience, our brain forms new connections between two neuron synapses. And neuroplasticity tells us that the brain reorganizes the pathways, creates new synapses, even creates new neurons in response to learning experiences and memory foundation. Now, what we also know is that how, how long and how severely we, we experience a certain outcome matters. How, how long and how severely we experience inflation will matter for how it gets ingrained in our brain. Emotional events tend to attain privileged status in memory. So inflation fear, inflation panic will lead to a connection being formed between seeing increasing price tags and fear and panic about being able to afford things that's much more long-lasting, long-term potentiation than when it's shorter and less severe. And when I say it has an effect on us, I really mean on everybody even the person who has learned knowledge that tells them otherwise. Learned knowledge doesn't seem to help. And my favorite example to illustrate this is this guy here, born under the name of Heinrich Wallich in 1914, here in Berlin, in a family of bankers. As a young adult, he lived through Germany's hyperinflation in 1923. His family ultimately emigrated via South America to the US, where he had a super successful career in the financial industry, New York Fed, getting a PhD at Harvard, Yale professor, and ultimately as a governor in the Federal Reserve System for 12 years. Now, Henry Wallach, by then, <laughs> um, is still famous today in Fed circles as the man who kept warning everybody that inflation is around the corner. His colleagues were not seeing the dangers of inflation. Whenever the Fed chairman proposed, maybe we can lower interest rates and worry a little bit more about unemployment and the industry and getting consumers to be optimistic, he stood up, dissented. He still holds that today the record of dissents in the FOMC and re-explained the dangers of inflation. Now this man, is clearly highly educated, highly intelligent, has all the data about inflation at his fingertips, and yet he can't seem to shake the experience from a different country decades earlier. So what happened to him? What made Henry Wallach not being able to get rid of that experience? The best way to learn about it is to look at the uh, uh, literature on trauma in your psychiatry. We learn often with gruesome examples from war, severe accidents, abuse, how these traumatic experiences can rewire our brain and lead to certain triggers, leading to reactions, even if we rationally know this is not appropriate. Now, examples like the German hyperinflation certainly fit that bill. Great Depression would fit. Having lived through the pandemic might fit for some of us. But what I want to emphasize today is that it's not only big T trauma that can rewire our brain and affect economic decision making in the long term. There's also small T trauma. The daily paper cuts, the daily exposure to stressors, the daily worry about food, food insecurity, prices, unemployment can reshape our thinking and our outlook at the world and our decision making in a lasting manner. So let's think back, for example, when for many of us last year we were in the supermarket and we saw prices creeping up, price tags go up, unpleasant experience. For some of us, a really worrisome experience. Can we pay the monthly bill? What do these little annoyances or fears or stressors do to us? Well, it turns out they can explain one of the big puzzles in research on inflation expectations. And that puzzle is that in pretty much any data set you look at, you find that women are much more pessimistic about future price increases than men. Started with a Swedish data set from the 1970s, has been replicated in the US across European countries. So why are women so much more concerned and have truly exaggerated fears about uh, inflation, about future price increases on average? Well, it turns out that if you dig into the data, and for example, here you replicate 
in a data set from before the recent inflation, um, what the differences between men and women are in inflation expectations. You find, yet again, women have higher inflation expectations. And then you go to the usual suspects. Do women have less financial education, less financial literacy? Are women just not good with prices and finance? Doesn't do it. However, there's a simple question you can add to your survey, as we did. And that is, you ask people, by the way, who does the grocery shopping in your household? Grocery prices are very interesting because they are super volatile. In fact, they're so volatile that central bankers tend to take them out of inflation, not look at them if they're trying to understand inflation trends. Well, but consumers look at them. They look a lot at them. And every time you see some of these volatilities, it scars you. So what we found is that if you put in your predictive model an indicator for, do you do grocery shopping for your household? The whole gender difference disappears. It's fully explained and on the right side, the bigger bar. It's fully explained by who does grocery shopping in your household. As long as we have, following traditional gender roles, more females than males doing the grocery shopping in their household, these differences in expectations and, of course, the resulting decision-making, what you're willing to spend on, will persist and will not go away from differences in training and financial literacy. So what does this mean for welfare, for politics, for society? For starters, policymakers have to start and acknowledge that when they're trying to combat an inflation, combat an economic crisis, and boy, have we had crises recently from COVID, supply chain issues, energy prices here in Germany. It is great that they're trying to get us back to normal, to the status quo ante, but it does not suffice. Once we are back to, say, our target 2% inflation, once the energy prices are similar to how they were before Ukraine was attacked by Russia, we will still not act the same way, consume the same way, save the same way, make the same financial decisions as we did before. And these are really big decisions. These are some of the biggest we make throughout our lives. Do we buy a house or not? How do we finance our mortgage? In the US, you know, what college do we send our kids to? Because that tends to be pretty expensive. So even when we are back to the status quo ante, we have to acknowledge we face a different population. And that is, by the way, why we talk about different generations, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z. It's these joint experiences that have left traces in our brains. Now, what can we then do about it if we want to fix these scars? Well, for starters, some of the traditional policy methods, like making a credible announcement, like monetary policymakers like to do, won't quite have the bite we would like it to have. If the central bank fully credibly announces it does monetary policy transactions, which will, through monetary supply, change inflation, we might all agree with that. We may have all perfectly understand, understood monetary theory, and yet it won't really affect us in our decision making the same way the beautiful economic models say only once we see it in the supermarket, once we see it at the gas pump, we will start altering our behavior. And this is why somewhat infamous policy decisions, like in Germany during the energy crisis, the Tankrabatt, the German gas price discount, actually have something positive to them. So to explain, when gas prices jumped up and everybody at the gas pumps are, whoa, it is really expensive to fill my tank and, and drive, policymakers thought, oh, let's subsidize those prices and help people. Economists were in uproar. That was exactly the wrong thing. If supply goes down, prices go up, and that's a good thing, because the price signal tells the consumer, don't buy so much of this stuff. We have very little. Reduce your driving. So it went economically from traditional economic policy exactly in the wrong direction. However, from the perspective of human economics, economics that goes away from a model where we are little robots that just process information perfectly and come to the perfect uh, decision at the end of the day. Economics that acknowledges the overwhelming evidence that we change as we make these experiences, that economics will have to acknowledge <coughs> that we need to take into account that it also lowers the fear of people. 
that the panic about inflation will be reduced and the long-lasting effects will be reduced. Now what if you can't quite do that? What if you can't quite get into the gas pump, if you can't quite get into the supermarket? Well, then let's try to get as close as possible to that and let's make the announcement as experiential as possible. And this is where I think we can take a slice from, for how example, the Central Bank of Jam Jamaica talks about inflation. They made up reggae songs, which people, are you? <laughs> they made up reggae songs that, <laughs> that told people how to think about inflation. And that's the breakthrough in economics. Let's make economics truly about humans and let's break down the wall of inflation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>